Let's start with a big question. What is nuclear fusion? It's the underlying process that powers the universe. So as the name implies, it fuses together or brings together two different elements, technically nuclei, that come together. And if you can push them together close enough that you can trigger essentially a a reaction, what happens is that the The element typically changes, so this means that you change from one element to another, chemical element to another. Underlying what this means is that you change the nuclear structure, this rearrangement through equals mc squared releases large amounts of energy. So fusion is the fusing together of lighter elements into heavier elements. And when you go through it, you say, oh, look, so here are the initial elements, typically hydrogen, and they had a particular mass, rest mass, which means just the mass with with no kinetic energy. And when you look at the product afterwards, it has less rest mass. And so you go, well, how is that possible? Because you have to keep mass. But mass and energy are the same thing, which which is what E equals mc squared means. And the, the conversion of this comes into kinetic energy, namely energy that you can use in some way. Um, and that's what happens in the center of stars. So fusion is literally the reason life is is viable in the universe. So fusion is happening in our sun. And what are the elements? The elements are hydrogen that are coming together. Um, it goes through a process, which is probably gets a little bit too detailed, but there's it's, it's a somewhat complex catalyzed process that happens in the center of stars. Um, but in the end, stars are big balls of hydrogen, which is the lightest, it's the simplest element, the lightest element, the most abundant element, most of the universe is hydrogen. Um, and it's essentially a sequence through which these processes occur that you end up with helium. So those are the primary things. And the reason for this is because helium has uh, features as a nucleus, like the interior part of, of the atom, that is extremely stable. And the reason for this is helium has two protons and two neutrons. These are the things that make up nuclei, that make up all of us, along with electrons. And because it has two pairs it's extremely stable. And for this reason, it when you convert the hydrogen into helium, it just wants to stay helium and it wants to release uh, kinetic energy. So stars are basically conversion engines of hydrogen into helium. And, uh, and this also tells you why you love fusion. I mean, because our, our sun will last you know, 10 billion years ap- approximately. Uh, that, that's how long the fuel will last. But to do that kind of conversion, you have to have extremely high temperatures. It is one of the criteria for doing this, but it's the easiest one to understand. Why is this? It's because effectively what this requires is that these hydrogen uh, ions, or which is really the bare nucleus, so they have a positive charge. Everything has a positive charge of those ones. Is that to get them to, to trigger this reaction, they must approach within distances which are like the size of the nucleus itself because the nature in fact what it's really using is something called the strong nuclear force there's four fundamental forces in the universe this is the the strongest one but it has a strange property is that it while it's the strongest force by far it only has impact over distances which are the size of a nucleus so to get put that into what does that mean it's a millionth of a billionth of a meter okay incredibly small distances. But because the distances are small and the particles have charge, they want to push strongly apart. Namely, they have repulsion that wants to push them apart. So it turns when you go through the math of this, the average velocity or energy of the particles must be very high to have any significant probability of the reactions happening. And so the center of our sun is at about 20 million degrees Celsius. Um, and on earth, this means it's one of the first things we teach, you know, entering graduate students, you can do a quick, uh, you can do a quick, uh, basically power balance and you can, you can determine that on earth it, it requires a minimum temperature of about 50 million degrees Celsius on earth. To perform fusion. To get enough fusion, uh, that you would be able to make, uh, get energy gain out of it. So you can trigger fusion reactions at lower energy, but they they become almost vanishingly small at lower temperatures than that. First of all, let me just linger on some crazy ideas. So uh, one, the strong force, just stepping out and looking at all the physics. Is it weird to you that there's these forces and they're very particular? 
like it operates at a very small distance and then gravity operates at a very large distance and and they're all very specific and the standard model describes uh, three of those forces extremely well and there's- And this is one of them. And yeah, this is one of them <laughs> yeah. and it's just all kind of works yeah. out. There's a, a big part of you that's, uh, you know, an engineer that you st step back and almost look at the philosophy of physics. So it's interesting because as a scientist, I see the universe through that lens of essentially the interesting things that we do are through the forces that are get used around those. And everything works because of that. Richard Feynman had, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Richard Feynman. It's a little bit of a tangent, but. He's never been on the podcast. He's never been on the podcast. He yeah. was unfortunately passed away, but one of like a, a, like a hero to almost all, all yes. physicists. And a part of it was because of what you said. He kind of looked through a different lens at these, what are typically look like very dry, like equations and relationships. And he kind of, I think he brought out the wonder of it in some sense, right? For for those, he posited what would be, if you could write down a single, not even really a sentence, but a, a single concept that was the most important thing scientifically that we that we knew about that in other words you had only one thing that you could transmit to like a future or past generation it was very interesting it was um so it's not what you think it wasn't like oh strong nuclear force or yeah. fusion or something like this and it's very profound which was he was that the reason that matter operates the way that it does is because all matter is made up of individual particles that interact each other through forces that was it so just that atomic theory basically yeah. yeah which is like wow that's like so simple but it's not so simple it's because like wh who thinks about atoms that they're made out of like i i this is a good this is a good question i give to my students how many atoms are in your body like almost no students can answer this but to me that's like a fundamental thing yeah. by the way it's about 10 to the 28 10 to the 28 <laughs> so that's uh you know Trillion, you know, million, trillion, trillion, or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So one thing is to think about the number, and the other is to start to really ponder the fact that it all holds together. Yeah, it all holds together, and you're actually that. You're more that than you are anything else. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean there there are people who do study such things of the fact that if you look at the, for example, the ratios between those fundamental forces. People have figured out, oh, if this ratio was different by some factor, like a factor of two or something, I was like, oh, this would all like not work. Mm -hmm. And I look, you look at the sun, right? It's like, so it turns out that there are key reactions that if they had slightly lower probability, no star would ever ignite. Mm -hmm. And then life wouldn't be possible. It does seem like the, <laughs> the universe <Yes. laughs> set things up for yeah. us that it's possible to do some cool things, but it's challenging. So that they, they, they keeps it fun for us. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I look at it. I mean, the you know the multiverse model is an interesting one uh, because there are you know quantum scientists who look at and figure. It's like oh, it's like oh yeah, like quantum science perhaps tells us that there are almost an infinite you know variety of other universes, but the way that it works probably is it's almost like a form of natural selection. It's like well, the universes that didn't have the correct or interesting relationships between these forces, nothing happens in them. So almost by definition, the fact that we're having this conversation means that we're in one of the interesting ones by default. Yeah, one of the somewhat interesting, but there's probably super interesting ones where we, I, I tend to think of humans as incredible creatures. Our brain is, is an incredible computing device, but I think we're also extremely cognitively limited. I can imagine alien civilizations that are much, 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 much more intelligent uh, in ways we can't even comprehend in terms of their ability to comp to construct models of the world, in, to do physics, to do physics and mathematics. I would see it in a slightly different way. It's, it's actually, it's because we have, um, we, have co we have creatures that live with us on the earth that have cognition, right? Mm -hmm. That understand and move through their environment. But they, they actually see things in a way, or they sense things in a way which is so fundamentally different, it's really hard like the tra it's it, the, it's the problem is the translation, not necessarily intelligence. So it's the perception of the world. So I have a, a dog, 
And when, when I go and I see my dog, like, s- smelling things, there's a realization that I have that he sees or senses the world in a way that I can never, like, I can't understand it because I can't translate my way to this. We get little glimpses of this as humans, though, by the way, because there are some parts of it, for example, op- optical uh, information, which comes from light, is that now, because we've developed the technology, we can actually see things you know, I've had, I get this, you know, as a, uh, one of my areas of research is spectroscopy. So this means the study of light, you know, and I, and I get this quote unquote, see things or representations of them from, you know, the far infrared all the way to like hard, hard x-rays, which is several orders of magnitude of the, of the light intensity, but our own human eyes, Mm -hmm. like see a teeny, teeny little sliver of this. So that even like bees, for example, see a different place than we do. So I, I don't, I, I think if you think of, there's already other intelligences like around us in a way, in a limited way, um, because of the way they can communicate. But it's like, th- those are already baffling <laughs> in many yeah. ways. Yeah. It, so if we just focus in on the senses, there's already a lot of diversity, but there's probably things we're not even considering as possibilities. Yes. For example, uh, whatever the heck consciousness is, could actually be a, a door into understanding some physical phenomena we're not haven't even begun understanding. So just like you said, spectroscopy, there could be a similar kind of spectrum for consciousness that we're just like we're like these dumb uh, descendants of apes, like walking around. It sure feels like something to experience the color red, but like we don't have. It, it's the same as in the ancient times you experience physics, you, you experience light. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's bright, and you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 and you construct kind of uh, semi. Well, it's interesting. Kind we of we 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 might actually experience this faster than we thought because we might be building another another kind of intelligence. Yeah, and that that intelligence will explain to us <laughs> how silly <laughs> well, we are. <laughs> we, there was an email thread going around the professors in my department already. Of uh, so, what is it going to look like to figure out if students have actually written their term papers or it's chat uh, the the chat the, GPT. The, chat GPT. Um, uh, <laughs> it was, so as, as usual, as, as empir- we're, we tend to be empiricists in my field. So of course they were in there like trying to figure out if, uh, if it could answer like questions for a qualifying exam to get into the PhD program at MIT, which was, it, it, they didn't do that well at that point. But of course, this is just the beginning of it. So yeah. we have some interesting ones to go Eventually for both the students and the professors will be replaced by Chad GPT. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll sit on the beach I really recommend, you know, this. I don't know if you've ever seen them. It's called The Day the Universe Changed. This is, is that a movie? James yeah. Burke. Yeah. He's a science historian based in the UK. Um, he had a, had a fairly famous series on, on public television called Connections, I think it was. But the one that I really enjoyed was The Day the Universe uh, Changed. And the, the reason for the title of it was that... Um, he says, the universe is what we know and perceive of it. So when there's a fundamental insight as to something new, the universe for us changes. Of course, the universe from an objective point of view is the same as it was before, but for us, it has changed. So he walks through these, these moments of perception in, 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 in the history of humanity that like changed what we were, right? And so as I was th- thinking about coming to, to to discuss this, you know, people see fusion. Oh, it's still far away, or we've been it's been slow progress. It's like when my when my godmother was born, like people had no idea how stars worked. <laughs> yeah. So you talk about like that day, that insight, yeah. the universe changed. It's like oh, this is the. I mean, they, and they still didn't understand all the parts of it, but you know, they basically got it. It's like oh, because of the because of the understanding of these processes is like we unveiled the reason that there can be life in the universe. That's probably one of those days the universe changed, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and that was in the 1930s. Yeah. It seems like technology is developing faster and faster and faster. Yeah. I tend to think, just like with ChatGPT, I think this year might be extremely interesting just with how rapid mm-hmm. and how profitable the efforts in artificial intelligence are that just stuff will happen where our whole world is transformed like this and we're, there's a shock and then next day you kind of go on and you adjust immediately. Uh, you probably won't have a similar kind of thing with uh, nuclear fusion with energy because there's there's probably going to be an opening ceremony and stuff, <laughs> yes. an announcement that take months. <laughs> but with, yeah. uh, with digital technology, you can just have a 
immediate transformation of society. And then it'd be this gasp, and then you kind of adjust, like yeah. we always do. And then you don't, don't even remember, just like with the internet and so on, yeah. how the days were before. And how it worked before, right? Yeah. I mean, fusion will be, because it's energy, it's, it's, its nature is that it will be, um, and anything that has to do with energy use tends to be a slower transition. But they're the most, I would argue, prof- some of the most profound yes. transitions that we make. I mean, the reason that we can live like this and sit in this mm-hmm. building and have this podcast and people around the world is, is at its heart is energy use mm-hmm. and it's intense energy use that came from the evolution of starting to use intense energies at the beginning of the industrial revolution up to now. It's that it's like, it's a bedrock actually of all of these, but it doesn't tend to come overnight. Yeah. yeah. And some of the most important, some of the most amazing technology is one we don't notice because we take it for granted because it enables this whole thing. Yeah. Exactly, which and, is energy, which is a- amazing for how fundamental it is to our society and way of life is a very poorly understood concept, actually. Just even energy itself, people confuse energy sources with energy storage, with energy transmission. These are different physical phenomena, mm-hmm. which are very important. For, so, for example, you know, you buy an electric car and you go, oh, good, I have an emission-free car. And, uh, ah, but it's like, so, so what, why do you say that? Well, it's because if I draw the circle around the car, I have electricity and it doesn't emit any, anything. Okay. But you plug that into a grid where you follow that wire back, there could be a coal power plant Mm -hmm. or a gas power plant at the end of that. Oh, really? I mean, so this isn't like carbon free. Oh, and it's not their fault. It's just, you know, they don't. Like the car isn't a source of energy. The underlying source of energy was the combustion of the fuel back somewhere. <laughs> Plus there's also a story of how the raw materials are mined yeah. in which parts of the world uh, with sort of basic respect or, or deep disrespect of human rights that happens in that mining. So the whole supply chain, there's a story there that's deeper than just the particular yes. electric car with a circle yeah. around it. And the physics or the science of it too is the energy use that it takes to do that digging up, which is yeah. also important and all that. Yeah, anyway, so, so yeah, we, we wandered away from fusion, but yes. Oh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful but it, stroll. But, it, but it's very important actually to, in, the, in the context of this, just because, you know, those of us who work in, in fusion and these other kinds of um, sort of disruptive energy technologies, it's it's interesting. I, I do think about like, what would it, what is it going to mean to society to have an energy source that is like this? Um, that that would be like fusion, you know, which has which has such completely different characteristics. Uh, for example, you know, free unlimited access to the fuel, but it has technology implications. So, what does this mean geopolitically? What does it mean for how we how we distribute wealth within our society? It's it's, it's very difficult to know, <laughs> but probably yeah. profound. <laughs>